bump to the environment since they're they're uh, re uh, or unregulating deregulating everything and letting all these people do whatever the fuck they want so that their stock will go up so that they look good uh, but we'll just not live long enough to fucking see the results of it but anyway so if you got a, if you've been using roundup Round up Stephen, because if you need to sue, call Stephen P. New. Um, I, I want to rectify real quick one thing before we go on to our main events. I, on, on Twitter, again, the past couple of days, there are still these people that are arguing with Dave Meltzer that he doesn't know about a, a particular thing in wrestling history. Any particular thing in wrestling history. It's He's so, a it's fucking so savant. It's, what, it, it's, they're like the Trumpers. You can say no. Not only does he is he right about this the the story that he just told from something that happened twenty years ago, but here's what he wrote about it twenty years ago, which was the same fucking thing. And here's what it's generally accepted happened because that's what happened by everybody over the last twenty years. They said, oh, but no, because one fucking guy that was there then said, "God damn, maybe it's because the one fucking guy turns out to be the fucking south end of the northbound mule in the story." Did you ever figure that? You dumb fucks. As I've said, I just want to clarify this. I have problems with Dave's opinions about the newfangled wrestling these days. But as far as a historian and who's studied multiple aspects of the business and trends and has spoken to the principles at the time on almost every event, whether they will admit it or not, and he has an encyclopedic memory for this shit, and he's... Right, and I've actually talking to Meltzer for uh, over the past thirty years has been easier to talking to a lot of guys in the wrestling business because he gets it from all sides. And I just I understand, you know, shit stain and and Bischoff knock him because he tells the truth about a lot of the stupid shit that they did with Bruce. It's shtick because he he can't. I you want to think he can't actually believe this shit, especially when he changes his story a lot. But he's the one that still says that Terry Taylor being the Red Rooster was not a rib on Terry because Vince was fucking pissed at him because he was a cocky little prick. And oh, if, if Terry embraced it, it could no, it killed him. It did. It was fucking horrible. It was awful. Just go in and admit it. I, I wonder if even Vince will admit it after all these years. If even if he didn't do it on purpose, it just sucked. But anyway, uh, but I always tell people if you're going to knock somebody, tell the truth about them where it's verifiable. I always said, I, Shawn Michaels, I thought, was an unprofessional prick in the 1990s, but I also always said he was the performer of the decade, and in the ring he was incredible, because it, it, it's in front of your eyes that that was the truth, and everybody acknowledges that was the truth. So if I said, no, Shawn Michaels sucked in the ring, then that's a credibility killer instantly. I lose all of it. No. He was tremendous in the ring, unmatchable. He was just a fucking obnoxious, unprofessional prick for most of that decade. So that's the truth. But when you, when you, Bruce says Jerry Jarrett was a bad booker because he don't like Jerry. I think Jerry treated him like a flunky when he was up there. Uh, but you can't say that uh, it, when it's obviously, uh, patently, documentably, verifiably untrue. Then you lose all your credibility. But some people who... Haven't studied the issue, much like the Trump voters. So for fuck's sake, and have you noticed when you've inter well, it, you might have interacted with some of the guys in a different way, but there are a lot of top guys in the business that you get surprised they don't know a lot about the business. And I mean, it, like... If a wrestler, if, if for example, the same reason that, that a great actor is not always a great director or a great writer or producer, um, if a guy was always a top wrestler but never worked in the office at all or never promoted in, and and especially in the territory days when you had to be all in on one thing because seven nights a week you were either wrestling or you were booking, thinking twenty four hours a day or whatever the fuck. But a lot of guys that that wrestle but were never in the office didn't know a lot about how the office worked and they would take the the they formed their opinion as, be, as being one of the boys the office is always out to get us ah, they don't want us to get over too good whatever um if guys who even worked in in the office but didn't study television you'd be surprised how many main event wrestlers you know that have been in high levels in places that that could not 
explain the rudimentary aspects of how to produce a television show because that was never their deal. Or I think Bret Hart in his book said he he never saw Ric Flair until what nineteen eighty eight or whatever some late fucking date I don't know, but a lot of the guys in the territories, especially the top guys that had homesteaded and were in the same territory and uh, year after year, they didn't watch other fucking wrestling shows. You couldn't in the seventies unless you went to those places, and in the eighties, uh, the last thing a, a main event guy in a territory working every night was going to do was watch other wrestling shows. I was probably the only one in the Crockett Promotions locker room that actually saw other television programs, and sometimes they didn't didn't even watch their own because they were on the road. I had to make an effort to do it because I was just that way. So. A lot of times, if if you spent your career with the NWA or WWF, you didn't see some of the top guys of the other company. That's how the but, Observer really got big in the locker room in the first hand. It was the nature that yeah. you could actually see what was happening in the different territories for the first time. So at any rate, uh, you know, just because somebody was there didn't mean they picked up on the information that was being laid down or they might not have been around at the time after all or whatever. But it just it just gets so tiresome. Anybody says, oh, well, Meltzer doesn't know. No, Meltzer knows every fucking thing. And that used to be the topic of conversation. How the fuck does Meltzer know everything? Because he knew everything. He knew I would sometimes when I was in WCW after TBS bought it. I would hurry to read The Observer to find out what was going on in the company I was working for. And it was always right. Anyway, speaking, and here's some, here's apparently another group of fucking people that don't belong in the goddamn wrestling business. Did you see, and I don't really know a lot of details, but the gist of it, because I've just read this, as as we say, maybe something else has happened. Um. Oh, and, and you got to tell me your breaking news about Omarosa. We haven't even talked about that in a second. But after I tell my breaking news, because we're taping ahead of time, apparently somebody has just said now that they're asking or the WWE is investigating Randy Orton. The headline on the Internet or whatever was Randy Orton being investigated for improperly touching himself. And what the fuck? And I click on apparently what he was doing. It's a variation on an old rib, but what he would do is when he would meet one of the new writers, they'd set it up, I guess, as a rib where, you know, they'd bring the writer to him or whatever. As soon as the writer's walking up, he fucking pulls his dick out. He's he's got his hand around his dick, and then without pulling and putting his dick back in, he reaches out to shake the guy's hand like, hey, I'm Randy Orton. Nice to meet you. Hey, what's the matter? You don't want to shake my hand? What are you, big dogging me? Wait till I tell Vince or whatever the fuck. To see what the gal do. And if, I guess he that's a thing he did to the new writers. I don't know if he had cohorts helping set it up or whatever. But now somebody has said that. So the WWE is investigating it, I guess, from however many years ago this happened. What the fuck? It's a variation on a, a, a lot of times if a guy with especially a green young rookie or a referee or somebody that was going to be kind of fucking, you know, a, a nervous – Don Knotts-ish anyway, right? You'd bring him up to the booker, and the, and the booker would be standing there naked in the locker room and scratching deep in the crack of his ass, and, oh, hey, kid, how you doing? And, what do you, you know, you got to shake the hand, right? Or whatever. Or uh, if we got that far away from the wrestling business that this is somehow just not fucking funny, that that's what fucking guys do? For heaven's sake. Dusty. When Dusty was a booker for Crockett Promotions, the second biggest wrestling company in the world, he, and, and for many years before this, his standard locker room outfit was his cowboy boots and nothing else. Maybe a, 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 a towel ever, and, and sometimes a, a hat, either the cowboy hat or a fucking baseball cap or whatever. Um, the, the Fargo's rib, Jackie and Don Fargo. Uh, Jackie'd come in the fucking locker rooms and start naked saying, Hey, anybody seen my toothbrush? I've lost my toothbrush. And he'd turn around and it'd be sticking out of his ass. Here's the thing. If, if Orton had really been doing this to the, because this is apparently hearsay on the internet, if he'd really been doing it, the first one that had gone for the handshake and gone past it and grabbed his fucking knob and squeezed as hard as he could, Vince would have made the head writer. I guarantee you Rip Rogers would have done that. So your suggestion here is that... That would have have been the counter. Is to grab his dick? Yes, and squeeze it as hard as you can and watch him fucking... Watch his face. 
That would have been what in 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 the, in the days of the locker room of the territories. That would have been what somebody would have fucking done. I'm just telling you. But we can't look at it as if they would have done it in the territory days because it's a different world. This isn't the territory days. This is corporate wrestling, a corporate environment, a publicly traded company. If you want to be in a fucking wrestling business and you're surprised when one of the boys fucks with you, then you don't need to be in the wrestling business. Your fucking feelings are too fucking fragile. I have a question for you, and I never thought of this before. Do you think all those writers want to be in the wrestling business or they just want a writing gig? Well, that's the problem is a lot of times, especially in recent years, I guess it's a thing to put on your resume for a TV writer that you were with WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment or whatever on, you know, whatever network. But so that's yes, but that should be the immediate weed out. If you don't want to do this for the rest of your life, you got no business in it. Get the fuck out of my building, basically. I'm sorry. A unique, that's, a unique know. perspective. <laughs> well, what the fuck? It's a God damn it. What, that's why that's why it's so passionless and emotionless and soulless and contrived and fucking choreographed and goddamn uh, it, it plopped out like a turd on a plate like it is instead of it being real because it's a bunch of fucking people that think they're going to get a writing credit or go on to make, as Dusty said one time, made the most in pictures and sitcoms. But the guys in the wrestling business were going to be making the made the most in pictures and sitcoms about people being in the wrestling business. Anyway, it just it just gets my goat. Just it just chaps my ass, just grinds my gears. <laughs> what year did they say it happened? I don't even know. I don't know what the fuck. But apparently it was several years ago. But it's being they're they're looking into this situation. I don't know. But it just fuck. I, <laughs> but once again. Wouldn't that be the first thing you'd think of? Well, I'll fucking, you know, because that, that story would go everywhere instantly. Hi, ah, he fucking squeezed Orton's dick. The guy would be over his first day in the fucking door. Not because everybody hates Randy, but just because they got him. Anyway, like I said, if Vince heard that story, he'd have made him the head writer. Why not just blow him then? I mean, you well, become no. a legend. No. <laughs> said, no. Because... The whole idea is Randy's doing something to make you feel uncomfortable. What are you going to do about it? Well, if you blew Randy, it wouldn't really make him feel un- – well, it might make him feel uncomfortable, but it would be more pleasurable than if you grabbed his fucking crank and yanked it. Yanked it like you were trying to pull the fucking ripcord on the parachute 50 feet from the fucking ground. <clears throat> I guarantee you somebody would. I'm just saying. Anyway. Uh, you've got a, a, a big news, breaking news. Also, Omarosa has a pair. Omarosa's got tapes. You were just well, telling me about this, just reading this shortly before we went on the air. You're familiar with Omarosa, the reality show star, correct? Un- unfortunately, she has been around Donald Trump for years, and now she's obviously turned against the Trump administration and Donald Trump. And she was on Meet the Press this morning. What a baby face turn, Jim! All in white, crucifix, center chest. <laughs> And she has fucking tapes. She was recording John Kelly firing her in the Situation Room. She says she has other tapes. She says she not only heard about, but she actually finally did listen to or see, I forget, the tape of Trump using the N-word when he was on The Apprentice. This was a really... Okay, okay, okay. Now, now, in what... I don't mean to say... con. In what context, though, was, was, he, was he mad and browbeating someone and using racial epithets, or was he telling off-color jokes nobody wanted to hear or was he trying to be a white rapper in what context was this word being uttered from him i could rule out the white rapper part but i'm not exactly (laughs) certain of uh, exactly what the answer is and and so but she taped john kelly firing her didn't she get drug out by the secret service from what we heard well the story was she i mean and what a story this was that she tried to storm the personal residence in the white house when she found out she was fired that she went crazy and tried to get to Donald, and they had to drag her out of the White House. And uh, this tape. What does, it, what does this tape sound like? First of all, it's the only conversation she ever had with John Kelly. And it's just John Kelly very sternly saying uh, that, you know, she'll no longer be there. It's, integri- it's an issue of integrity, uh, which she pointed out was funny because he defended the integrity of the guy that was beating up his two ex wives. <laughs> And he wouldn't let go of him. He said, it's a man of integrity. But he questioned Omarosa's integrity, of course, while she's taping him at that very moment. (laughs) He questioned her integrity. In in the situation where, well, I guess if Baba Booey got fucking Trump on Air Force One and a reality TV show star can walk in with a fucking tape recorder in her purse in the situation room. And then he basically threatened her, as she put it, where he said, 
we could do this really nice and easy, or if you leave, it could be not so easy. And then, of course, after this is when she started getting emails from 